Our first speaker is Dr. John Mkengan Song, who is the Associate Director for Laboratory Science from CDC Atlanta, Georgia. John has been in the field of HIV for over 25 years, starting well back in his own country of origin in Ivory Coast. He's going to talk to us about the compact of uh, the, compact, the impact of COVID-19 on HIV, TB, and malaria epidemiology, and the treatment services which are available across the region. John, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, greetings from the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where in the next couple of minutes, I would like to discuss with you the impact of COVID-19 on HIV, TB, and malaria epidemiology and treatment services in Africa. But I would like to, uh, first of all, give, give you an update of the COVID-19 situation on the continent uh, as of today, and then uh, uh, discuss in the end what the impact uh, would likely be on HIV, TB, and malaria services. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate at the Interest 2020 conference, which it has always been a fantastic uh, uh, conference for, for everybody to attend. It's a pity that we cannot do it in person this year. Next slide. slide. So, so in the next couple of minutes, what I'll do is to explain to you the epidemiological situation of, of uh, COVID-19 in Africa discuss Africa CDC's response, and then uh, end up with the leadership strategy and challenges that uh, pose with respect to TB, malaria, and, H and HIV. This slide shows you how uh, the pandemic has evolved. As, as of today, over uh, 2 million people have been infected on the continent with about 85% recovery and uh, about 49,000 deaths, representing a case fatality ratio of 2.4%. But if you look at the graph on your right-hand side, it shows how the pandemic has evolved. Uh, it took us 133 days to move from uh, 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 zero cases to uh, uh, half a million cases, and then 30 days to move from 500,000 cases to 1 million, about 60 days from 1 million to uh, 1.5 million, and 42 days again accelerated to about 2 million. And this slide shows you the moving, uh, the epidemiological situation since the pandemic started. And the, 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 the red line is the seven days moving average. And uh, you can see that uh, as a continent, we peaked around uh, August uh, the timeline. And then we're, we're, we're recording about 18,000 cases per day, and then decreased steadily to around uh, uh, October. And then now we see that cases are beginning to creep up uh, consistently, slowly, and we are now at about 10,000 cases per day. And if you look at the continent carefully, there are more than 70% of new cases reported in Africa are coming from about uh, five uh, countries that include Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Kenya, and South Africa. And they're all indicated in red on that map. And if you break down further and you look at the number of COVID uh, cases reported uh, across Africa per million population per day, you realize that 47 countries are reporting less than 40 cases per 1 million per day. Uh, three countries are reporting 40 to 80 cases per 1 million. And uh, uh, three countries more than 100 cases per million. In, I mean, and we don't have information for two countries. Uh, if you now go by region and you say what has been the trend, overall trend, uh, you see that uh, 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 overall, uh, cases have been uh, uh, have, uh, uh, rather in, in begin to increase. If you look at the first uh, 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 chart there, with about 18 percent increase. So Central Africa, we've seen this is again as of 15 of November. Uh, Central Africa, we see some decreases, but we are all overall seeing uh, increases in North Africa, in Southern Africa, and in East Africa. 
If you take some few countries as a case study, South Africa, you see that nicely. They have bent their, they bend their curve uh, between uh, uh, mid-September uh, to uh, now. And as you can see that their cases are beginning to increase by 17%. Uh, and if you look at Morocco, Morocco has really uh, 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 did very well from the start in March right up to around August timeline. But then something happened. And then you see steady increases, a uh, uh, consistent increase, uh, where uh, between September 15 and, and uh, October 15, about 41% of uh, the cases uh, uh, increased, and then suddenly a steep increase to, uh, of about 74%. And then you look at Tunisia, a very similar story. Tunisia did great, remarkably at, at, at control of the virus between March and, and September. And then after September, you can see that the numbers actually increase uh, pretty much uh, rapidly. And Ethiopia is doing uh, uh, pretty well, where we see that the numbers have increased steadily, peaked around uh, uh, August, September timeline, and that has, has continued to decrease uh, 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 remarkably well. And we hope that that trend continue in, in uh, Ethiopia. And Kenya, I mean, it's fair to say that Kenya is experiencing the second wave already, where you see that it did very, very well early on. But since September, we've, we are seeing a remarkable increase in the number of, of, of cases in, in uh, uh, Kenya. And if you now look at the testing, you said, I mean, as a continent, uh, uh, what have we done? I mean, we've tested uh, cumulatively a total of 21 million uh, with a test uh, per case ratio of 10.3 and uh, with uh, a positivity rate of about 9.7%. Uh, and if the curve you see that shows, the dark line shows the, the positivity rate, the, the orange or the colors there are the new uh, tests pe performed. And then the red bars there are the, the case, the new cases that we, we, we are detecting. And if you look at that carefully, you see, notice that uh, uh, less than 16 countries are reporting uh, less than 10 tests per case. Uh, so a majority of countries are beginning to uh, 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 test where they should be. That is what the WHO recommends, that we should be testing uh, at least 10 tests uh, per case. So I think overall testing scenario on the continent has improved. I mean, uh, we would like to do more, but compared to where we were in June, when uh, or May period where the pandemic gains team, I uh, mean, we are doing re uh, relatively uh, well now. And uh, again, we are very optimistic that with a new initiative to expand antigen testing uh, that was uh, called uh, launched by the, the WHO, UNITED, the FINE, the Global Fund, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we will be able to do better in terms of scaling up up to about 120 million antigen tests. Let me now switch to uh, the, the, the response itself as a continent. The first case, as you all know, of the COVID-19 on the continent appeared on the 14th of February in Egypt. And then um, we immediately uh, uh, convened a, a, a meeting of, of the, uh, the, the entire continent to develop what we call a joint continental strategy that had three pillars. One was to prevent transmission, the second was to prevent death, and the last was to prevent harm. And this is where the core of this conversation lies. I mean, how do we prevent harm to other diseases, i.e. Uh, HIV, TB, and malaria? So this slide just shows you the meeting that uh, the emergency meeting of ministers of health that was uh, convened in Addis Ababa under the leadership of the chair of the African Union Commission, uh, Chairperson Faki. And uh, uh, then since then we've developed uh, uh, several partnerships to advance uh, testing. One of those was the partnership to accelerate COVID testing, which was underpinned by the need to test, to trace and to treat. And we set ourselves some ambitious targets early on, and we exceeded those uh, those targets, and then set a second target of uh, testing up to 20 million uh, people. That means we, including uh, other partners like WHO and other foundations that supported us in in uh, achieving this target. 
a platform has been established called the African Medical Supply Platform, uh, which is a single online marketplace to enable the supply of COVID-19 related critical medical supplies. And this is a, a true example of public-private partnership between uh, Strive Masiwa, who is the AU Special Envoy, in partnership with the Afri, uh, African Export Import Bank, Afri Exim, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNICA, and more partners there. If you want to uh, 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 give yourself a try, you can go to amsp.africa to see how the platform works and which is a remarkable innovation in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. And this slide just shows you the response, some of the response activities. We've deployed over 200 rapid responders across 23 countries. We've also used the power of community health workers by deploying about 9,000 community health workers in uh, 18 countries across the continent. And if you look at this slide carefully, it's, it's a remarkable slide in many dimensions. In January, there was no laboratory on the continent that had the capacity to diagnose uh, for uh, uh, COVID-19. In February, uh, to be very exact, uh, February 8th, uh, two countries had uh, developed the capacity in Senegal at the Pasteur Institute and in South Africa. And we've since used that capacity to roll out uh, diagnostics in all member states now and actually uh, contributed about 6 million of those tests uh, out of the 20 million that has been conducted and trained over 1,300 lab personnel to do lab testing across the continent. And this slide just shows you some of the training that we did early on in Senegal and in, uh, 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 and in uh, South Africa, uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, it also, way before the COVID hit the continent, we started uh, preparing the continent for infection prevention control, where we trained 22 countries, and you can see them on the map with 40, uh, uh, five participants. And just turning on to uh, the, the, the issue of vaccines, I think as a continent, we, we are very keen on saying, making sure that history does not repeat itself and that we really preach the concept of global and continental cooperation uh, to ensure that Africa has access to timely uh, uh, vaccines as they become available, uh, that is vaccines against COVID-19. And we published this paper in, in Nature just a few weeks ago, and where we drew inspirations from the experiences we all had when uh, we, we were dealing with HIV in the mid 90s, where the antiretroviral drugs were available in 1996. It would take 10 years before they were finally available in Africa. And in between that period, about 12 million Africans died. I think we should really make sure that that doesn't happen in this uh, scenario of uh, the, the COVID pandemic, where there's a natural uh, a scramble for um, uh, vaccines. I mean, we should really see that vaccines are, that are available, are, are accessible in a timely fashion to all countries in the world in a manner that we can use that to fight COVID-19 in a collective manner. And President Namaposa, who is the chair of the African Union, has been extremely uh, 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 supportive of this initiative. He has convened a meeting to endorse a strategy that we put in. And, and I would just like to point you to the last line of that statement that says the head of states and government of Africa stressed that Africa should take appropriate measure as part of the strategy to ensure that it secured timely access to COVID-19 when they become available. And the strategy has three pillars. Uh, one is to ensure that we take part in clinical trials. And then second is to make sure that we have sufficient vaccine quantity in terms of procurement. And lastly, to remove barriers for uptake for of, of vaccines. And we estimate that about 1.2 billion as a continent of 1.2 billion, we need to vaccinate up to 60% of our population to achieve herd immunity. That is going to require about 1.5 billion doses with a cost of about 10 to $15 billion. And just uh, two weeks ago, President Ramaphosa established the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team that has the, the, the mandate to urgently look at ways to implement this uh, strategy in terms of acquisition and financing of vaccines, uh, enough vaccines for the continent of Africa. 
Let me then just uh, 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 end uh, by discussing the impact that COVID is great to have on an existing endemic uh, uh, diseases, uh, both uh, the HIV, TB, and malaria, and other immunization programs. I mean, one thing is clear that HIV, TB, and malaria are not, have not gone away because of COVID. And uh, in, in our view as Africa CDC, we have to be very deliberate and focused in making sure that, that those programs are not neglected. For years, HIV has driven global health. And now we now see that uh, uh, emerging infectious diseases are going to threaten uh, those, uh, those programs. HIV kills about 500,000 uh, 500, people on the continent of Africa each year. And a combination of HIV, TB, and malaria kills about 1.2 million people each year in Africa. So that is very, very important. Our greatest concern as Africa CDC is that the gains that we've made in all three areas, including maybe I should add the immunization programs are going to be eroded uh, in a significant manner, in a way that uh, is going to be, uh, the effect are going to be felt after so many years uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really have to continue to advocate for those uh, programs to be funded, uh, that, that we do not uh, uh, take staff away from those programs to allocate them to COVID-19, but that we look at ways that building a workforce that will be competent enough to help us, enable us fight COVID-19, but also maintain those other programs there. And let me just uh, uh, conclude by some final takeaway messages that we need to continue to have a unified leadership across the continent to fight COVID-19. COVID-19 has not gone away. Uh, COVID-19 should be a stimulus for us to launch a new public health order that really calls for Africa to invest in its own, uh, uh, invest in strengthening public health systems on the continent. And the partnership should actually be uh, um, uh, uh, based on the, the, the philosophy of the oppressed, which means that Africans have to take leadership in this themselves. We cannot mortgage the health security of our continent uh, uh, outside of the continent. It wouldn't be the, the partnership has to come and support us support what we are doing and not replace what we are doing. We need adaptive public health workforce development, as I just explained, so that it can cater for those endemic diseases, but also uh, support uh, the, the, the current challenges. And very importantly, is that we have to begin to think of local manufacturing of diagnostics, um, uh, vaccines, and medication there to ensure that uh, that we protect HIV, TB, malaria program, uh, as well as immunization programs while we continue to take, tackle the current pandemic. Let me just conclude then by thanking all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be part of this very important discussion.